Hello and welcome to Insight Live, I, the IT experts take. I'm Jason Rader, your host, and today we're going to be talking about maximizing the business value of AI. And we've got some rock stars with us to help through this conversation. We've got the one and only Carm Tagliente, who is the Distinguished Engineer and Portfolio Director for us here at Insight. And we have a new person on the show, Megan Gentry, who is the National AI Consulting Practice Manager. Megan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, so let's jump right into it, guys. Um, actually, we've got a lot of survey stuff that um, we are going to refer to some of some in one survey, but we always send out a survey question. Uh, so let's kind of get started with that one, if you will. So the survey question that went out for this particular episode is related to what challenges do you face related to AI use? And the, the options were access to quality data, uh, security and privacy, data or analysis bias, and talent to implement. What do you guys think the number one was? I would have thought that it would be data, but it wasn't because I already looked. But oh. it's like, so it's, um, yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting because normally when we take these kinds of surveys, it usually comes out that way. Um, so it's kind of interesting, especially for this group. So, you know, as we, I'll keep that in the back of my mind as we talk about it, because uh, clearly there's a focus there. But um, I don't know, Megan, what do you think? Yeah, I actually thought it was going to be quality data as well. And, um, and that was maybe it's a that shift. Was yeah. Right. Yeah, maybe so, it's and, a shift from um, uh, uh, having not enough data to actually having more data than we know what to do with. And, uh, you know, being a security guy, I was always, you know, the security and privacy to me is number one, but that was the second lowest. Uh, and talent was third. And the number one was uh, data or analysis bias, which I think is interesting because that to me shows a certain level of maturity about the people that are answering the question, right? Totally. Yeah, I mean, understanding how bias can impact the, you know, the, I'll call it the interpretation of the data um, by the machine learning algorithm or even by our own human biases, that is kind of interesting um, to see. And it, it, you're right, it does represent a level of maturity, I think, for the consumer or for the, the users of this capability. So let's kind of set the stage for the folks that are joining us. And we talk about a, we've talked about AI and chat GPT and a lot of things recently, but what we're kind of talking about is challenges that businesses face. And we've got, you know, Megan here from that delivery perspective and working directly with folks to deliver those solutions in AI. So we've got some interesting stuff to kind of tee up, but I think let's, let's kind of set the stage and we, Excuse us if for those AI experts that are out there, including both of you, but let's kind of talk, talk about and confine, what are we talking about when we're talking about AI related to business use in this particular case? Who wants to take a shot at that? Megan, you want to go or do you want me to go? To Megan, yep. Go for it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, artificial intelligence is obviously a really hot topic, but um, most artificial intelligence that businesses are using today is some form of either a... Uh, machine learning application, a deep learning application, and now we're even delving into generative AI. So um, really it's a matter of what is a system that can learn from past data, that can um, act on that data to make some sort of decision, and then uh, you know learn uh, over time from some sort of feedback loop on how it's doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, some, some new concerns are rising up around, you know, how do we, how do we handle um, some of these AI models when they're released into the wild. And one of the key things to figuring out the business value of these models is how do we measure their ROI? And then how do we make sure it stays um, up to expectations as it uh, matures and, and exists in the wild for a while? Yeah, I think it's a great point. And, and I would also look at from the, you know, it's sort of the practical application as we think about it um, with respect to data-driven decision-making, because that's fundamentally what we're trying to do. We're, and, you know, sometimes we might think of it as automation, you know, especially around the generative sense, you know, we're talking about uh, chatbots where we're able to maybe automate the conversation or conversational agents. Um, or in the case of, I'll call it classic machine learning, it's sort of help me understand my data assets better or my behavior within the organization. And I, and I think those are some of the practical applications, of course, we're all enamored by the shiny object, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, quite a bit. Um, but in general, it's really 
the sort of practical aspects I think that we want to get to today. Absolutely. And I think that's sets the stage. So I think from our perspective, you know, folks at Insight, when clients come to us, they typically have some motivations behind what they're trying to accomplish. That's almost always linked to business outcomes that they're looking for. And I think, you know, when AI, there's, it's a, it's a big category and it's, I will say, I think it's safe to say some folks misuse the term or misunderstand the term. And that's going to continue. I think as we go, I don't mean us, I mean like marketing or just spin in the media and those types of things. But in general, is it something people aren't coming to us saying, Hey, how do I get rid of all my employees and replace them with robots? That's not usually the use case that we're looking for here. I think Carm, to your, your point that you just made, it's, We've got a vast amount of stuff that we can make whatever we data that we can use to make whatever we do better and faster and more engaging to the people that we're doing it for. Right. Yeah. And is that fair to say? Is that kind of a. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and that, that usually takes a platform. It's not usually. AI built into this one point product or those things. So I think, you know, people would think they have to obtain this whatever the newest thing that they use application or whatever that says AI in it, it's more than that, right? We're talking about a platform and I guess that's what I'm trying to get to. Sorry, not very eloquently, but uh, let's talk about what that platform is. Well, I, I think the, um, and, and I think it was the way that you described it, I think is very, was a very eloquent actually, but, but I think where we're really looking at is um, maybe if I simplify the concept, it's about how do I identify value within my business or within the concept of my business objective. So it's sort of this concept of value creation and then helping to move toward value realization. So it's sort of like, what kinds of things do I want to do better? You know, in and I can look at the application of AI to help support that, but then how do I recognize that value? So a lot of times people will say, my data is my asset or my resources are my asset. But then how do you, um, how do you recognize that value? And in the case of AI, we really want to focus more on, well, what kinds of questions am I going to answer? What kinds of benefit am I going to get? Um, and that's really sort of the fundamentals of getting to that point where I can create a platform. So once I've identified how to do that in that cycle, how can I then build, um, I'll call it automation or repeatable processes that allow me to be able to do that, i.e. the platform um, as we think about that. So anyways, that's kind of how I would think about it. I like it. Megan, yeah. any kind of, what's kind of a practical approach from your perspective of, of, of accomplishing, accomplishing this nebulous thing that I just said? Of course, yeah. I think Carm mentioned a really important part about the platform, you know, in, enabling a repeatable process for using AI and seeing the outcome and then providing feedback to that system. Um, that's where you see long-term growth of an organization using AI over time. Where it really starts is with the teams in organizations that are actually developing AI. Um, so someone has to build it, right? Someone has to release it into the environment. So we were actually working with a auto parts manufacturer a while back, and we introduced a cloud platform to them for AI development uh, in-house. and. Uh, that directed us to confront some pretty big questions around MLOps best practices, so machine learning operations best practices. You know, we started answering questions for them uh, around the platform, like, you know, how should data scientists and AI engineers use the platform to discover new opportunities or work down their wish list? Um, what kinds of stage gates they might use um, to put a AI system from a proof of concept stage to a development stage, um, what kind of you know, stage gates they have to pass through to get through the testing stages for that human in the loop uh, success criteria. But basically the, the major outcome, I think, of a platform centric approach is that it gives you something that's repeatable, but evolving as an operating model where you can actually you know, address and fine tune where the bottlenecks are of the AI lifecycle, right? Um, as a data scientist by trade, you know, I'm always thinking about, you know, what's keeping me from getting this into the hands of the user. And a lot of those things are still mysterious and, and, and businesses are trying to squash them. I love that. And I love the fact that we're, we're talking auto parts, you know, uh, that's a, 
that's the opposite of what I think of when I think of people leveraging AI, which is that's so that's so beautiful because again, and the fact that they, they want to create a platform so that we're not just solving a single problem, we're creating a platform so that we can grow and 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 leverage this even more than just kind of solving this tactical thing that maybe a lot of people have right in front of them. So that's awesome. I think the one thing I'll add to what Megan said, which was awesome, is the um, that agility that we talk about in terms of the ML processes and repeatability. The, the faster we can turn the cycle, for example, then we can, and I'll relate it back to the survey, we can then um, identify potential bias, biases and then be able to um, remo remove them either through the process by using e algorithmic techniques or sampling techniques or other kinds of data techniques, which would allow us to be able to do that, or even interpretation bias, which might be something completely different in terms of who is interpreting the data assets. but. That is critical as well, because if, if it's a, hey, we're going to go off for a year, figure out the answer to the problem, and then come back to you, well, that's not really going to help very much. And if there was bias in there, oh, well, um, it's not really going to provide much. So we're really focusing here at Insight, as well as probably across the industry, is how do we turn this faster? So how do we get that cycle, um, sort of reinforcement learning cycle moving faster for us, but also for our customers? Nice. So, you know, we talk about when we talk about these things enabling business and I think one of the questions I always ask folks, you know, thinking from a, if I were a business owner, how do, who are the people that are engaging you, Megan, like within a business? Is it like business leaders that come after this? Is it, is it somewhere in the middle? I guess that's my thing is like, who is it that drives these types of things that, or, or did it come to you as they were working on another solution and they they thought that ML or AI was the thing that was going to get them there? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do, Jason. Thank you. Um, really, the AI opportunity in a business comes from anywhere in the business, right? You can talk to any business unit and whether it's operations, HR, sales, marketing, you know, if it's manufacturing, let's just say inventory, logistics, supply chain, all of those things have their own unique problems. And there is a space for AI in each of them. Um, each industry is going to have their unique ways of handling their problems with AI. Um, you know, I mentioned manufacturing and, and, you know, one that's coming to mind that's really popular lately is like food delivery services. And you would imagine, you know, food delivery services, you're moving food from point A to point B, but there's a lot of things that could go wrong in that process. If your supply chain's broken, you can't meet demand. If you don't have a demand forecast, an AI driven demand forecast, you can't um, get the right staff planning. If you don't have the right staff planning, then uh, the supply chain to the consumers is not, is not going to hold up. And uh, if your drivers don't have the right navigation planning that's AI backed, they're not going to know um, where to go or how fast they're going to be able to get there. And they might miss out on great tips and, and, and may leave, leave your organization. So there's all of these different opportunities for predictive modeling, and they can really come from anywhere in the business. But um, one thing that we've seen be really, really successful is just talking to the directors of IT in an organization or talking to you know, someone that kind of owns the platforming and infrastructure, and especially security, data strategy. Um, talking to them is really pulling from the root because we're taking kind of an inventory of what their current operating model is and, and listening for those pain points of like, like, what can we do about the data and the infrastructure to free you up to go pursue some of these AI opportunities? I love that. And, and I think what you just said kind of brings, it, it's thematic based on almost all of our conversations, especially when we talk about kind of what, how Insight approaches things is that it's not this point in a business. It, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're very platform focused. We're very much creating something that's going to be leverageable across the business. And there's usually not just a tech component to it. There's usually a culture and a, you know, change management aspect because it's, it's hard to go from back to the auto parts manufacturer. It's hard to go from this to this without everybody kind of being on board and understanding the way that we're going to leverage this and the way that we're going to move forward. Right. Yeah. I think the one, the one thing, um, for us to think about too is uh, while things are business driven these days, um, the capabilities are really critical because it's like, what are we able to do as an organization versus what we want to do? And I think probably, I hate to date myself, but you know, probably 10 or 15 years ago, it was all about the capability. It's like, do you have a data scientist on staff? Do you, do you know how to use these particular models? Can you define what they are? 
and they sit in the back room and they did their things. But now when you apply it to business and we're really focusing now on, I'll call it, you know, current generation AI is really focused on how can I drive the business forward? But then ultimately it comes down to what capabilities do you have in your organization? And I think, you know, what Megan's describing is that there may be a gap there. So what is the gap? So what kind of services do we use in order to help you to realize these capabilities or how do we provide either services or develop a center of excellence, which allow you to be able to take the result, carry it forward, and then really sort of evolve the organization to be more AI, I hate to be say AI focused, but leverage these capabilities is probably more appropriate because we're not trying to you know, brainwash anybody, but we're, we're trying to say that you can really take benefit from having these capabilities so long as you understand how to apply them. Is the barrier for entry the same as it was 10 years ago? I think I know the answer to this question, right? Yeah. Uh, we don't have to dial in all of these experts and gear. Now we can leverage you know, services and capabilities in the cloud and those things that that'll basically, people who are late to this game, they're not out of the the game at all they're they're they can leverage the latest and greatest of what's going on and and still be very much in this yeah so i think in a lot of ways and i'm sure megan has a good perspective on this too but in a lot of ways as we you know you remember probably five years ago there was a shortage of data scientists we don't have enough people that allow us to be able to do this um so now all of a sudden you start to move more toward um increasing capabilities by things like low code no code auto ml capabilities so how do we make it easier for the people, I'll call it the analysts community, um, to be able to put the power in their hands to allow them to be able to leverage some of these techniques. Now, clearly they're not gonna be as good as someone like Megan's going to be or her team, but you also don't need that level of customization. Um, think about computer vision solutions today. Computer vision solutions are pretty easy to use. We can deploy them, there's packet services, you can do object recognition relatively simply, but you know, 15 years ago, you it was really hard. You had to really, you know, you had to train your own, um, your own algorithms. You had to identify your own objects, etc. It was really more difficult. Um, but I think that's kind of the model we're seeing, and we see this across the technology industry, anyways. You know, as you see, it becomes more um, democratized as you move forward. So then we move on to the next big challenging thing, which is kind of the you know helping to solve these complex business problems um, that Megan was describing, like with the auto, um, the auto company. Yeah. I'd, I'd add to that, you know, the way we look at talent it is changing and evolving as well around the AI world. You know, like Carm said, the life of a data scientist five years ago is a lot different than it is now. And it's because we get to focus on better things now. And by better, I mean um, AI in AI today really is not about building these fancy models and hitting an accuracy metric, right? Those are things we really know we can do with most of the technology, most of the algorithms, most of the great packages, all the legwork. You know, we're really standing on the shoulders of giants here um, using AI to our advantage. So it's not about building the most accurate model anymore. It's about making sure that we meet a specific success criteria for the business. So one common problem that we see is clients allowing their development teams to measure project success by, you know, model accuracy or some um, super specific metric, but at the same time, holding leadership accountable for the project meeting a totally different success criteria, right? Whether it's number of users or adoption or some, you know, bottom line ROI that is so disconnected from that development team that it's hard to bridge the gap between the folks that are putting their mind on developing AI systems and the folks that are actually going to be benefiting from them. And so what we try to do is break down that barrier and say, no matter where you are in the AI system, if you're on the outside benefiting from it or um, you know, experiencing it, or if you're the inside building it, you all have the same goal in mind. Um, you know, for example, an AI system with like a 95% accuracy in detecting defects and parts on the manufacturing line may not be actionable in practice, either because the inferencing is showing up too, uh, too delayed it's too delayed of an inference, or maybe the user interface where the user's consuming it isn't giving them the right, um, you know, precision or the right visual for them to do anything about it. So it's, it's the full system that we take a look at, not just the data science development piece. And I think that's really important today. And we, we really just didn't have the mechanism to focus on that five or 10 years ago. 
Right. The other the other thing I'll add to that is um, while all of that is, you know, we're talking about really advanced concepts, um, but it also comes with an ROI. So how much investment are you willing to make in getting it just right? Or maybe we're trying to do things that are maybe a little bit beyond cur the current state of the art. So we have to be careful. Is it worth the investment to be able to get there? Uh, that 100% solution, if you will, or whatever, 99% solution. But I think that's also an important thing to think about because uh, in a lot of ways, companies that go all in, let's say on these capabilities, um, sometimes overcommit or they're like, we just spent so much money on trying to do this that if we actually looked at the ROI, we would say, maybe we should have just you know, used a few humans and sort of augmented their capabilities as opposed to trying to solve everything with this very complex model or set of models that allowed us to be able to accomplish our goal. So I think there's a good blend there. And I think we have to make sure that we can make sense out of what's the current state of the technology? How does it relate to the business? And then what's the right thing to do from an organization perspective? That's a great point. I think, you know, just like cloud adoption where people are like, we're going to the cloud 100%. And then, well, wait a minute, this isn't the greatest thing for everything. Right. And, and I, I think we're right in that same. And I think, Megan, you brought up a really fantastic point about that, you know, okay, well, we've used this model to find out whether we're doing it right, but we can't do anything about it. Uh, and so making sure that it's more than just the AI aspects of things, it's the overall capabilities of the the line or the different things that we're talking about to be able to, to affect that in a, in a way. And ROI is hugely important. I mean, I, I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, some, some examples of how you're showing ROI with clients, uh, if you've got some examples you can share. Or, or at least ways to calculate that from their perspective, right? Yeah, so I so I think the the easiest one is is really just focusing on projects that are using capabilities. So you can measure commitment, headcount commitment, length of project. Um, those kinds of things are are really important. A lot of organizations focus on optimization. You can measure optimization and cover uh, financial metrics, which are kind of the simplest thing to do. The qualitative metrics are a little bit more difficult um, to measure. For example, um, we did some work for um, uh, a healthcare company, and you know, really just focusing on how can we improve the um, uh, accuracy of a particular type of operation, for example, um, or the techniques that are used in order to perform certain surgery. Um, those you can measure qualitatively in terms of um, whether or not they succeed, whether or not you ever repeat, for example, or not. It's not life or death kinds of things. So just nobody has to worry about that. But in general, um, can you measure success? Um, that actually has a financial implication to it um, because you what you can measure then in that particular case was how many repeat operations, for example, something like a spinal surgery. If I have to go back and have um, three operations instead of one, there's a cost to the hospital and that's totally quantifiable and you can measure success pretty easily there. So then you can compare that again to and I won't go too much longer, but you can compare it back to the how many resources did I expend in order to be able to solve that? And that ROI was pretty clear. It's, you know, operations, as we all know, are probably a big deal, not only from the personal perspective, qualitatively, but also financially for the healthcare organization. Love that. Anything for me, Yeah, yeah. Some of that um, uh, qualitative uh, ROI that we're looking for might be around the the safety and the actionability. Well, I'll say the action of actionability of a model that might target something like safety or security of someone's personal data or even themselves. So um, we're talking with a, a construction organization that wants to be able to uh, take action on high risk parts of a construction project, right? And so if we're looking at that, you know it's not just important to say, hey, this is a likely time or area or situation where you might want to focus attention to prevent a safety incident, but also we want to tell them why. And uh, that's that's the kind of the complicated part of AI is, is explicability, explicability and actionability of anything that we release out there for, for folks to interpret. It's extremely important and it should probably be a, a key consideration when you talk about using AI responsibly. You know, in, in a lot of situations, especially in healthcare, um, it's really important to have explicability as one of the things that you consider before you start developing an AI system because you want that traceability, you want to be able to go back and check 
um, uh, how you arrived at a conclusion about something. And so sometimes ROI is about how much do I understand what came out of the system? Love it. Well, you know, we talked about, and the whole conversation kind of led us to, there's, there's a lot more than just whether we're talking GPT-3.5 or GPT-4, you know, those kinds of, of things from a tech perspective. So what is the, you know, how do businesses organize to take advantage of this value prop? What are, if we were trying to tell people how to kind of enable themselves so that they can come to somebody like us to help them deliver on it, uh, what's the advice that we, we have? That's typically how we like to close these things out. How do you get started? What's the advice that we've got? We'll go to Megan, then we'll close with Carl. Sure, yeah. Um, I would say it's important to get the right experts in the room, whether it's a business strategist, maybe a, an infrastructure and security lead, agilist, or someone that can handle the change of the organization. Um, of course, the AI builders, the people that understand the AI um, and, and the directors of those teams. It's important to get them all in the room and understand what the short and long-term goals are for the organization and just make sure that everyone kind of understands what AI can do so that they don't rule it out, right? I think there's a lot of conversations that happen that are limiting. Um, I'd follow it with some kind of an assessment, take an inventory of what you've got, um, take a look at your AI opportunities, prioritize them, make sure you can at least speak to some of the ROI and start asking your, your development teams, you know, how feasible are some of these really high value things? Um, with the tech that we have today, a lot is changing. And so it may be easier than you think to get started. Um, and if there are bumps along the road in terms of getting something to production, which is a really common problem, you know, that's where production engineering and, and some of the greater things that are going on right now with uh, ML ops, you know, product systems, uh, softwares can really help you get going, but it only really works if everybody's on the same page. And yeah, Carm. I think that's great. Yeah, and I'll take a, a little bit more of an organizational perspective. And so um, I, I usually like to look, to talk about it in the context of organizational innovation, because I think organizations that tend to be innovative are the ones that will look at these capabilities like Megan was mentioning and say, okay, well, how is it that we can either um, increase our efficiencies, change maybe our competitive advantage, or maybe catch up to um, organizations that might be leading us in our particular area and think a little bit out of the box. And so I'll, I'll also talk a little bit about first principles of design. Like how do we do things differently? How do we allow us to um, enable these techniques to allow us to be able to be more competitive, to be able to be more cost-effective? Um, so the practical aspects of it, I think Megan was talking about, but I think culturally organizations have to organize to sort of have the freedom to think about well, why don't we try these capabilities? And if we fail, let's learn by them and then repeat. And this gets back to the agility. So building in ML ops or having the data assets that are required or getting the data assets that you might need in order to help to drive the this kind of changing business culture, um, I think is really critical because a lot of times organizations, and we've seen this before, and Megan alluded to it, we we bring in business agility teams because organizations don't really understand how to take advantage of the fact that they might have created this awesome um, result from a model that they've analyzed. They don't know how to change their business. So um, if we look at it a little bit differently, you have to organize around that, um, I'll call it that innovative cycle, and then you can really take advantage of these capabilities. Love that. And, I, you know, that makes me so happy from the perspective of those people who are out here kind of thinking we're behind the game. You know, business leaders that are watching this, we're behind the game. We don't have any of the stuff or haven't thought the way that these guys have just been talking about. Somebody like an insider, a partner can come in and help you ideate this, can help you put all these pieces together and can help you really take your business your people, what you do to the the whole next level, a level that you didn't even think about. So I don't, I mean, it's one of those things where I love things that empower businesses who just want to take this jump, who who don't want to do it, who don't have a blank check, who understand they've got some specific business outcomes that they've got to hit along the way. Uh, but but to take this capability that AI offers, but be able to, to put all the things around that to really deliver that ROI that they're looking for and to prove it and to allow them to have that platform to continue. 
that's an amazing thing. So I love that. Thank you guys for sharing all of your, well, not all of your knowledge, the knowledge that you shared uh, during this session. And uh, we'll probably have to talk about this again because there's just such good stuff related to this. So Megan Carm, thanks so much. Okay. Uh, we didn't get to the survey that we might have uh, talked about earlier, but there's there's a whole great survey that's got some AI pieces in it. And that survey is available to you on our website. And if you want to know anything more about what we do here at Insight, please come visit us at solutions.insight.com. And thanks for joining us today. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.